I won a Kaggle competition. I also earned a solo gold medal in a deep learning competition. And technically you, you have no quote unquote formal school degrees in machine learning. I, I even go further than that. I have no really? college degree at all. What? Success in your life depends on your ability to talk about your ideas, to write about your ideas and to have good ideas. And right now, of course, uh, a great way to learn to program is by talking to LLMs. So I can't imagine my life without Copilot anymore. That's to learn machine learning. You have to learn uh, calculus, statistics, probability. Okay, so and you just keep going down that path, which is exciting and is rewarding, but it doesn't do anything for you for doing machine learning, completely mm. nothing. But what you have to focus on is project-based learning, is understanding how you generalize to unseen data. What is the... Do you think someone could become great at machine learning if they don't love it? Why do it? The money's good. The money's good. Hey everyone, welcome to episode nine of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place to get to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today, we have Radek Osmolski. He's currently a senior data scientist, or more specifically, a senior system software engineer at NVIDIA. Radek has been on Kaggle for 11 years and is a grandmaster for notebooks, data sets, discussions, and a competitions master. He's also one of the top students from the famous Fast.ai course, and an author of Meta Learning, a book on practically learning deep learning. I highly recommend it. Radek, very excited to have you on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me here. Really appreciate it. So you and I both work at NVIDIA, which, which is great. Um, but what really impressed me and sort of drew me to your story, to be honest, was that how you got to NVIDIA through your work at Fast.ai and your great work in Kaggle. Can you give us a highlight journey on how you became a deep learning professional? Yeah, sure. So it was extremely accidental because um, I was in my uh, late 20s, approaching 30. That was 10 years ago. And I was extremely bored at work uh, with, with, with the work that I was doing. I was a mid-level manager um, in an IT support organization. And uh, back then, it was when the MOOCs were becoming popular. So I just would go online and start taking MOOCs um, to entertain myself, to just, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I learned a lot, like uh, a lot uh, of interesting things. Uh, I also thought that, hey, maybe it's a good time to start learning to program, which I learned from these courses as well. And uh, then one day I stumbled across uh, Andrew Engs, uh, a machine learning course, the previous uh, version of the course that he's giving right now, which was, you know, the robot with the, uh, with the, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the original uh, one, uh, <laughs> the original one. And I was just blown away. I, I fell in love. I, I it might have been uh, less than three. I'm not sure. But um, when we implemented uh, a neural network in Octave and you could also implement it in a vectorized way. And I saw the network converge and it was just, wow, this is so cool. And uh, my appreciation for machine learning, uh, my love uh, continues. So um, along the way, I became a backend developer, a Ruby on Rails developer. That was my first uh, uh, entry into the professional world of programming. But I didn't even think that that would be possible uh, uh, when I was learning these things. I, I thought that, hey, the, the developers, the, the real programmers, they probably learn something very secretive and very useful in their five years of uh, study. Uh, but uh, by accident, again, I, uh, I got the Ruby on Rails job and then another job. And then also not believing that I would ever do anything in machine learning professionally. Um, the things just took off. That's amazing. And you started, I looked at your Kaggle profile, so you joined 11 years ago, but how long into that process did you actually start taking competing fairly seriously? So I joined 11 years ago and that was 
probably around the time that uh, I was doing those MOOCs and mm -hmm. uh, in the discussion area for one of them, it was suggested that, hey, go on Kaggle and participate there because that's how you learn how to apply the things that we're learning here to real world problems. But so I created my account on Kaggle. I uh, tried to solve the Titanic problem, which is sort of the, how everyone begins. And then I opened uh, the couple of competitions that were given back then. And I was completely confused. Like, I didn't know what was happening. There was such a large disconnect between what I was doing, taking those MOOCs and learning machine learning, how I thought that it should be learned. Uh, reproducing the uh, academic curriculum, but on my own. Um, and I just didn't know how to even start on a real world machine learning problem. So uh, for, for a couple of years, I drifted uh, around. I learned various things that I thought were uh, important to doing machine learning, but it turned out that uh, I was wrong. And then I stumbled across FastAI again by complete accident. Uh, I, I don't read and I didn't read Hacker News. But for some reason, I opened up Hacker News that day. Maybe I was that extremely bored and I went through the posts and I saw a post by Rachel uh, Thomas. Um, and um, only then, after taking the fast AI course, did the competition on, on Kaggle suddenly start making sense. So mm. um, I tried taking the, core, the, co the course uh, um, like V1 part two, that was probably in February of maybe 2017 or something like that. And I, um, I didn't complete the course because it was too hard for me to start with part two. And at that point I thought to myself, okay, Radek, well, you've tried everything that there was to try. And, you know, we have a family to look after and you're not getting anywhere in machine learning. So. I completely spun down my AWS instance because back then hmm. uh, you really didn't have many options to gain access to a GPU. Uh, and for five months, I didn't do any machine learning because I, I thought, okay, I need to learn software development. I need to um, progress in my career. Uh, so I started uh, learning software development, uh, web development. And then uh, by accident, or maybe not by accident, probably, but, um, you know, maybe I got an email from FastAI or I saw it on Twitter that there will be another iteration of the course and I just couldn't help myself. Uh, I decided, okay, I'll give this course, I'll give machine learning one last chance in my life. But this time I will put my ideas aside and I will just do exactly what the course instructors tell me to do. So even if it sounds ridiculous to me, I'll just follow it step for step exactly. And that was uh, probably around September. It might have been 2017. Yeah, I think it was September 2017 when I started the course and I did, I went completely crazy about it. Like every moment of time that I had where I was not working or I was not doing something with my family, I spent on the course and uh, um, I came back to Kaggle at the beginning of 2018, would it be? Uh, I remember it was mm -hmm. uh, January um, and, uh, and then in later that year, I won uh, a Kaggle competition and uh, I also earned a solo gold medal in a deep learning competition. Mm, and when, so, so that was the... I don't know, maybe half a year when I competed extremely uh, hard at Kaggle. Uh, I got my own workstation and I would invest 20, 30, 40 hours into the competitions back then a week. Um, and and when, when, when I, so, so, so this led to uh, having machine learning uh, opportunities just come to me. Uh, people knew me from the forums. Uh, 
I also posted so much to the forums. I tried to answer other people's questions and I posed my own questions. That was extremely helpful, but people started to um, familiarize themselves with who I was. And um, I started getting job offers, which is something mm. I completely didn't realize that would ever happen. That was not my motivation. I just wanted to learn something cool. And um, the next year, so it will be the beginning of 2019, I think, in January, um, I, got, I started working on two very exciting projects, one in California, in Silicon Valley, the other in Dubai. And one was more NLP related, the other one was uh, vision related. And things somehow mm -hmm. went from there. So I quit my web development job um within a couple of months and i have been doing machine learning ever since which is unbelievable to me that's amazing you you quit your web development job you're getting good at machine learning you jump in by that time technically you have a family to take care of the whole time yes um yes. and one of the reasons i i truly love your story is that i think between you um even aldridge and I think one or two other folks at NVIDIA, I think you guys specifically got into NVIDIA because of the fast AI course and community. And that really gave all of you all a true foundation in deep learning, enough to actually be quite proficient at it, especially from an engineering perspective. So I, I always like to highlight that to, um, to different people in that doing the fast AI course can really open doors if you you truly apply yourself so i'm happy to to hear the backdrop of that story yes that's that's absolutely <laughs> true and you will like i constantly run into discussions online how come my metrics are the metrics of my model are improving despite the validation loss going up and people wondering what does it mean to overfit people saying that they can overfit to train data from a practical perspective, you really have to understand these things. And the fast AI course really does it for you. And there are, I could, you know, spend the next uh, half a day just listing out the stuff that are practically important, mm -hmm. where I feel that the fast AI course is, is the only venue where you, where they are being taught. Mm -hmm. So uh, listening to Jeremy Howard, he often mentions, uh, and I essentially listen to all his podcast interviews because I learned so much from them, but uh, he mentions that he started fast AI, uh, because back then there were only a couple of uh, universities, a couple of research labs where you could learn how to do deep learning. And he took the know-how and tried to democratize it. Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, all the little things that are extremely important to training your model well. And of course, people now use it on Kaggle. You can learn it via kernels to some extent, at least the good ones. And I bet that maybe there are other courses or uh, the Andrew Engs course that, that was also great because at length he discusses, uh, um, uh, the difference between the train set and the validation set and how generalizing to unseen data is uh, um, the name of the game and he discusses the learning curve. So uh, the core of uh, what machine learning is, um, you can definitely learn it at other venues, but I think that fast AI teaches it to, to, to the greatest extent and you really mm -hmm. come out. Uh, uh, I didn't appreciate it back then, how valuable that information is, how valuable that knowledge is, but uh, and I must say that I have been intimidated by people with PhDs or people having this position or that position. But uh, over the last couple of years, what I learned is that you don't really have to be intimidated because when it comes to training the model, fast AI really sets you up for that, uh, even for doing research work, which is um, mm -hmm. also something that uh, Many people don't appreciate and think that uh, people without a formal background, they can only uh, use APIs and high level libraries. 
uh, but that is not the case. Uh, um, I think that many professional organizations still uh, have to discover some of the things that you learn from fast AI or that you can learn from top mm -hmm. gugglers. But that's just my personal opinion and uh, I stick to, to that. It seems to be working. Mm -hmm. It, it definitely seems to be working. And, <laughs> and for those that are listening, you know, before the call, uh, Radek and I were, were joking about, um, you know, he mentioned he started off and it was hard to get a GPU. And now he can launch huge clusters of hundreds of GPUs given the work that, you know, he, he's working on in the video. So it's, it's pretty cool to see what your persistence aligned with. It seems like a good community and a good coursework can really set you up and technically, you, you have no quote unquote formal, what you call it, school degrees in machine learning, <laughs> right? It's just your, your practical stuff in well, Kaggle. I, I, I even go further than that. I have no really? college degree at all. What? Really? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. This, okay. So you're, you are now, I'm a big person of, uh, extreme overfitting because there's not many data points that you can find like yourself that, you know, you're at the top machine learning company in the world and you have no degree, no formal background in machine learning and you're working uh, on on very hard machine learning problems. So this is very, very encouraging, I think, for anyone listening. Um, no, uh, I don't feel I'm unusual. You know, I don't feel I'm anything special. Hmm. I just think that the recipe that uh, we are being taught, that we were taught in the fast AI course. And mm -hmm. then I sort of uh, um, experienced in my life and uh, tried to write down in meta learning. It's just the power of those techniques to learn and to create a brand as a machine learning person. Uh, mm -hmm. So th th those techniques can work even for somebody as myself. And by yes. that extent, uh, I feel that they can work for everyone. Hmm. Uh, you had a, you posted a video recently where you said, uh, you lied to all of us online saying that you are a data scientist, <laughs> but then you specified that you were a senior system software engineer. And I, I'm curious as to why you made that distinction. I'm not even sure what my position <laughs> name is. That's the reason. <laughs> and, uh, I think I checked my contract and it says one of these, but then somewhere else I saw the other one. So I'm not sure what I am, but I do work on deep learning <laughs> models. Yeah, and um, it has senior at the beginning. So it's either senior systems programmer or senior data scientist. Yeah. I hope mm -hmm. they're not referring to my yeah, like For me, I'm, I'm solutions <laughs> architect. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they might be referring to my age. I don't know. But um, yeah, I'm solutions architect. But it's interesting because you end up having to touch a lot of things, either on the deep learning side, machine learning side, deployment. Um, so it, 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 it's interesting that we're not bounded by these titles, but more so by mm -hmm. what's the problem that we're going after to solve. That's the beauty of NVIDIA. I think mm -hmm. NVIDIA does a lot of things right. Yeah, they, it's... You know, for anyone listening, if you ever get a chance to get into NVIDIA, I think it'll really open your eyes as to um, what a great company that trusts its people to do great work does. It's, it's a nice environment. Definitely. So when you joined NVIDIA, what was, what was the gap in your learning from when you started and, you know, you started working on production level code versus the stuff that you were doing in Kaggle? What did you have to learn as that delta coming in? There's no delta. Mm. The, no delta. the only thing was that locked and loaded. Interesting. Yeah, like absolutely. And uh, the only delta was that uh, my team used uh, TensorFlow, and mm -hmm. I didn't use TensorFlow. I mean, I used TensorFlow in the past, but I didn't find it uh, an exciting uh, technology to work with. So I would be more of okay. a PyTorch person. Um, mm -hmm. and I already had this background in developing software, so I knew how to use Git. I knew how to use GitHub, uh, thanks to fast AI, I also knew how to use remote workstations mm -hmm. and this 
generally, this is the gap between somebody who graduates from a university with a computer science degree or some other degree. They just don't know the tools of the trade. So I already picked them yes. up um, before. Uh, and the only thing, though, is that on my team, there were uh, extremely knowledgeable individuals and great software developers with, uh, you know, with, with experience from places like Spotify. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so it, it was maybe not a gap, but uh, where I felt that I'm lacking was in Python, just essentially in the way mm -hmm. that uh, really? they wrote Python code. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, Th this was maybe just an impression that I had because uh, I could still open PRs, I could still troubleshoot bugs, um, and uh, it, it was never part of my role to, let's say, author uh, a big uh, chunk of the library. Or you know, it was it was sort of what what, what other people on the team uh, did. Mm, so I would say that uh, I, my Python development skills are are still not there. Uh, in order to be able to do so, but uh, I don't mind. Like I don't use Python that way. I don't foresee myself using Python that well uh, th th that way. And if I really want to pick up the, that skill set, I think I would be able to. So I'm not intimidated by anything anymore. Hmm. That's a nice. That's a nice feeling to have, and I, I imagine especially with all this LLM stuff that's coming and, you know, we were discussing how it flipped. <clears throat> I think a lot of people's knowledge on its head and how a lot of people yes. are just coming into the field very easily now, not so easily, but there's this whole new field of knowledge being developed in, in real time. That's a beautiful attitude to have. Uh, your book, Meta Learning. So you wrote a book, mm -hmm. Meta Learning, based off of the learnings that you had uh, in mm -hmm. the Fast AI course. Um, that mm -hmm. book, to be honest, really forced me to start coding more versus studying more because you would have spent a lot of time studying and actually not learning much versus doing a lot more. Um, can you share about why you wrote that book and what are some major things that stop people from progressing in their deep learning journey? Sure. So I wrote this book after eight years of doing this online thing where I tried to learn things and I wrote it because I was uh, so impressed uh, by the things that I dis not discovered myself, but they, that I discovered along my path that I learned from Jeremy Howard by taking the course that uh, to some extent, I also learned from other people just by being online and, you know, following the right people on Twitter and so forth. I was just uh, so impressed to what extent these, uh, some of these things uh, make a difference. And uh, I'm fairly introspective. So for those eight years, I would write blog posts. I would think daily about why something works, why something else doesn't work. And I had this book inside, inside me sort of like um, half of the book, the, the more imp important part. I wrote in three weeks. I just sat down and mm. there was no, no hesitation. I knew what I wanted to write. Uh, then it took me a couple of months to maybe add a few more things that are not as essential, but that are still helpful. Uh, the biggest thing, um, and again, it's probably explained differently in the book, but I'm mapping it onto my um, experiences that I had recently. And sort of what I'm thinking about right now. So uh, the biggest uh, thing is that uh, when I uh, set out to learn machine learning, I will I tried to reproduce the uh, academic curriculum. And you can absolutely do this on your own because you have access to the same books. You have access to lectures from places like Stanford or uh, MIT. Um, of course, it's easier if you can ask somebody in a one-on-one -on -one setting, hey, how does that work? Or, but you can reproduce that curriculum. So I would do it for, for a while. And uh, I learned uh, listening to other people online that to learn machine learning, you have to learn uh, calculus, statistics, probability. Okay, so I would, for instance, I was learning statistics, or sorry, calculus, 
But to learn cal calculus uh, uh, better, you have to probably learn a bit of linear algebra. You have to mm -hmm. learn where the real numbers come from. So you have to learn real analysis. And mm -hmm. then you also start learning about set theory because you sort of need it as a component to understand some of the proofs. And you just keep going down that path, which is exciting and is rewarding, but it doesn't do anything for you for doing machine learning. Completely mm -hmm. nothing. In fact, it makes you focus on the things that are not important. And by that extent, you are uh, not doing machine learning as well as you could because you have limited attention span, right? So uh, in one of the first, it probably was the first lecture of a fast AI course, maybe V2 or V3, where in the first lecture, no, it, it must have been V2. In the first lecture, Jeremy says, uh, somebody, somebody from the audience asks, do we need to know calculus? And Jeremy says, oh, because obviously Jeremy knows uh, math uh, to an extreme extent. Uh, and uh, how he responds to this question, uh, being extremely humble. No, we have computers who can do this for you now. Like if you want to solve a calculus equation, just uh, uh, go here, go there, and the computer will give you the answer. But what you have to focus on is project-based learning, is understanding how you generalize to unseen data. What is the reason for having a validation set? How should you treat your validation set? How do you treat your test set? What are the issues when you're moving things to production? Uh, how do you deploy machine learning models in an ethical way and in a way where you, um, where you uh, deliver re real value to your uh, customers or stakeholders? Because deploying uh, deep learning models is uh, not an easy thing uh, because mm -hmm. there are so many uh, error conditions that can occur in uh, real life that maybe you don't have in your uh, represented in your test set. So how do you set up a process around that? How do you improve uh, all those things? This is, this is what is important. So by this single answer where, hey, you don't have to learn calculus, you can, uh, <laughs> Jeremy cut off the branch of learning where I devoted months, you know, where I poured months into it and uh, may maybe even years. And then I could focus mm. on what really matters. So focus on what matters, do project-based learning, and, and you'll be fine. And, and the beauty of project-based learning, again, is that you're not coming up yourself with what you imagine that you need to learn. You sort of learn the things that are important on the project because you can't solve this problem. Okay, so then you look for the answer. So it's essentially, uh, if we were to liken it to the Toyota production system, you don't generate waste along the way. And it's more mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. a pool system where you're being pulled towards some areas by the nature of what you're working on versus you pushing into the direction that you feel that is valuable, but might be completely orthogonal to what you want to achieve. You mentioned a little earlier about you sort of fell in love with machine learning and that mm -hmm to some degree drove <clears throat> more of your curiosity and, and more of your persistence to sharpen your skills along the way. Do you think someone could become great at machine learning if they don't love it? Why do it? <laughs> like, mm, the money's good. Why, the money's good. Why waste your life on stuff that you don't care about? And mm. it's very hard to, to go from zero to something in a field that you have to be forcing yourself to work on. There are other ways to make money, better ways to make money. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. I, I, cause I, my, when I first got into machine learning, I, I had no, no semblance of love for it. You know what I mean? I, it was more of a mechanism for me to get a green card to the U S mm -hmm. and that was like mm -hmm. my sort of driving force initially to, to go into it. And I think only now, you know, once you've achieved that initial goal and you, that curiosity still drives you. Because even if I, I decide, okay, well, I'm not fully in love with machine learning, but it's not the thing that I wake up every day. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. To, you know, this is all I'm going to do. I'm obsessed about a couple of other things. Um, mm -hmm. But the opportunity that it provides me 
and, and I, every time I think about maybe turning away from it, I just realize it's like, hey, this is actually the most, one of the most coveted skills in the marketplace right now. So it's interesting that we have uh, slightly different motivations for pursuing our craft. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just wanted to, I was actually just curious um, what your thoughts were on that. I think it so would if you, be... Uh -huh. No, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm listening. No, uh, it's a very valuable skill set. You're right. Like it opens many mm -hmm. doors. That's how I got to Australia, right? Because I mm -hmm. have this skill set and I can demonstrate that I have this skill set. But... This is um, a great... Hmm? Huh. So, so this is well, an interesting segue because, for instance, um, if I understand correctly, you come from Poland, I come from Trinidad and Tobago. I imagine Poland is a small region or considered a smaller mm -hmm. region. Is that accurate? Or smallish? It's the eighth uh, biggest uh, country possibly oh. uh, okay. in, in, in Europe, in Europe, in Europe. Uh, okay. okay. So it's, uh, but yes, yeah, so on the geopolitical map, it's not a very strong player, but uh, mm -hmm. it's a country that develops very quickly. We had the for great fortune of <laughs> being admitted into European Union, into NATO. And mm. yes, it's a country that's developing very fast. But where I grew up, uh, Łódź, Poland, uh, it's not necessarily the hottest mm -hmm. area for AI, right? Yes. And definitely where I come from, Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean is not <laughs> the hottest area for, for AI. And the reason why I bring that up is I, I think about people at home or I think about people in regions where um, they don't have access to the epicenters. They don't have access sometimes to the people. And how would you now navigate your career? Knowing what you know now, um, how would you navigate your career to a... Uh, I like to focus on high paying jobs just because I, I think mm -hmm. when people have a certain amount of income, it gives them a lot of freedom from that perspective. Yes. So how would, how would you chart a career knowing what you know now, but you were living in, let's say like a really small place or a place that's not an epicenter of machine learning. So money definitely gives you freedom, money that you have control over once it's in your bank account. It gives you freedom, it reduces your stress level, it does a lot of things for you. And whoever says that it's not the case, apparently was never, you know, on the verge without of it. being, yeah, without it. Um, so I would, I would, okay, so FastAI taught me both technical skills that are extremely valuable, but I think what was possibly even more valuable is learning how to learn nearly anything and also mm. how to navigate the online world, how to exist in the online world. And uh, I would probably apply that skill set, not machine learning skill set, but the ability to write blog posts, the ability to tweet or, or even to communicate on the forums with, with people from various geographies that have various needs, I would use that. And I think I would be able to dug myself out from any hole. <laughs> um, and I would also be able to make a career for myself in any field, just applying this mm. skill set. And again, you know, I'm, I'm nothing special. Like I'm, I'm not particularly smart. I'm not uh, uh, hustling. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I just feel that the skill set is is just very powerful. So that, that disappoints me that you're not you're not hustling because in my mind I'm I'm always hustling. Uh, but it's cool to see that you have such love for machine learning that um, you you become an expert at it over time. <clears throat> and uh, you you get a lot of mileage out of figuring out how to use your time as opposed to. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter how fast you're moving if you're moving in a random direction, right? Like uh, yes. it's the velocity in the direction uh, that you care about that matters. So that is much more mm. important because the search space of what you can do is infinite. 
Um, yes. And if you can optimize uh, what you devote your time to, you will have much better results with uh, less time invested. But it's also that uh, your life um, changes. Like when I was in my 30s, 31, 32, I had so much energy. I would stay up till 1 a.m. My family would go to sleep and I enjoyed this mm -hmm. time so much. But right now, for various reasons, like, you know, our health might be different between individuals and uh, we age in different ways. Like I know that right now I cannot do this mm -hmm. uh, and I can spend only this amount of time in front of a computer. So this hustle culture definitely is not for everyone. And I would even say that beyond a certain point, it leads to, um, to worse results because, uh, we only have, okay, so I have experienced this myself, this, how people work in Silicon Valley at a startup, they go to work early, they spend their entire day at work, working, then they go back home and they open up their laptops. But when I talk mm -hmm. to them at this point in time, I'm speaking to a zombie, you know, their, their ability to think is not, it's not there. And if, if, if you, if, even if you can write the code, I don't think you're being as creative or, and there's, there's nothing, there's nothing more than having a lot of code uh, <laughs> versus having less code that could be maybe a little bit better. Also, yes. uh, just the sheer fact how our mind works, you need to have this focus time on an activity where you seed your subconscious, and then you need to have this uh, diffused mode of thinking which you normally experience when you're taking the shower, when you're driving the car, when you're taking a walk, where those creative ideas really uh, formulate, formulate, where you have the eureka moments. Uh, so if you want to be productive, I feel that it's better sometimes to go a little bit more slowly. Yeah, I think that's been, personally, that's been the hardest but for me, because when you had finished my PhD or, you know, when your PhD, you're just, that's, you're completely consumed. There's nothing else that, because you essentially you want to escape that system and then you come into a different work system, especially if you're an international student. So I do feel, I definitely feel for folks who are on visas and international students, just because you're never really truly settled until certain paperwork comes and you can kind of truly express yourself. Otherwise you just focus on your job. Um, but yeah, I've, I've gone through a, a good evolution in my own self to not maybe burn the midnight oil, especially as you get older, you realize that has downstream effects on so much of your health, your mental health, your physical health, even if you're sort of staying in shape um, and all the late night pizzas and all those things, uh, you can't do it all the time forever. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And a little bit more creativity. Um, a little bit, mm -hmm. a little better decision making can have enormous impact on your life. So moving fast, if you're not moving the right direction is not very helpful. You had recently, well, not recently, but you had started a YouTube channel. And I think one <laughs> of the topics you speak a lot about is whether or not you should, you know, start blogging online or start sharing your content online. And I think um, that has roots in the fast, fast AI culture. So you've interviewed many experts on the YouTube channel. Um, I was just listening to one, I uh, forget the gentleman's name from Hugging Face, and you guys were talking about clean code. That Zach, was, that was like a beautiful, uh, Zach, yeah. yeah, that was a beautiful episode. <laughs> Highly recommend folks listen to yeah. it. Um, and that's where I learned about code smell. I, I thought that was an interesting concept. Um, what are some back, what are some best practices that uh, you use to keep your code clean? Mm. So I believe in code being written with the purpose to be read. Mm -hmm. And I take this idea from the Ruby on Rails world where okay. the, with DHH, the person who uh, invented that framework, he has very interesting keynotes from uh, Rails conferences, and uh, he likens writing code to writing an essay or writing a book. 
So you start with the first draft and then you refactor, you revise, and you optimize for the clarity of the message. And that's a great starting point. And it also starts with caring that actually how you write code is important, not in this abstract sense that you're somehow a better programmer or a better developer, but very quickly you find when working on machine learning problems that you're not able to move past a certain point if your code base is spaghetti code. Because, and if you listen to top tier Kaglers, like JFP, for example, a legendary Kagler and also our colleague at NVIDIA, what he says is that Kagli competitions are about the speed at which you can iterate. And mm -hmm. nearly every Kagler who reaches that level they go through this um, um, process of evolution where they realize that, hey, if I want to be better at machine learning, I don't actually need to study right now uh, machine learning techniques uh, because where I'm ailing is how I write my code. Mm -hmm. and so um, I, I, I don't understand why this is not uh, an idea that is shared, for instance, by many researchers. And in the interview with Zach, he, he said he thinks of different type of research code that I have been encountering over years, where research code can just, you know, code glued together when you have a full page of if conditions and uh, it's uh, I'm not good enough to deal with, with that type of world. Like I know that there will be bugs in my code, so I want to give myself a chance. And uh, machine learning code is the hardest code to debug. Maybe that and maybe distribu mm. distributed systems code. So yeah, you, <laughs> you really have to mm. think about what you write and how you write it. Why do you think it's, it's hard to debug? Like what, what components of it? Is it just because actually getting the traces of your error messages out, especially on <laughs> distributed systems or GPUs, that could be interesting. Hmm. Yes, that's, that's one problem. But the other pro problem is that your code might work. And this is a very mm -hmm. common occurrence with deep learning code. Uh, when you backpropagate the error, your code might be working. It might be doing something but you miss out on the last 5% of uh, uh, performance. And it's, it's so easy. The, the code can wrap around your, the mistakes that you make. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, how do you end up maintaining your programming skills, let's say, if you don't code every day? I, I think some folks mm -hmm. in the active jobs, if they're on an engineering team, you're coding every day. And some other jobs, you're not necessarily coding every day. What's your advice there? Don't listen to what people share on social media in terms of coding practices. Hmm. Because, um, well, for instance, everyone at some point gets excited about design patterns, right? And they feel that th this will be the, their solution to finally learning how to code. But for most people, this is completely not applicable to, to their, to their work. It might lead to over engineering, which is a very significant problem when you make something more complex than it should be for your use case. I would say just uh, read code and write code when you get a chance and start developing an eye. There are also great talks that you can listen to. Mm. Mm. There is the refactoring book uh, by a gentleman who's named Fowler, I think, which is, which is a great book to, to read uh, on, on some of the ideas. Uh, and uh, uh, th there are also many, many counter ideas, uh, so to speak. The, the book that uh, we discussed with Zach, I don't remember the name right now, but this was really eye-opening. Yes, I would, I would definitely recommend that, that book uh, just so... Because it's very, it's very down to earth. It's very sensible, and I might have it here on my Kindle. Uh, so we'll have the title here in a second, because I mm -hmm. keep coming back to that book over and over again. 
Uh, hmm. There's simply a lot of advice that's uh, that's not right out there that is not applicable to uh, to most circumstances. Okay, so this is the book. It's called uh, uh, A Philosophy of Software uh, Design. Is it? Okay, I'll have the A Philosophy of Software Design, second edition by John Osterhout. And uh, there's a lecture associated with that book that I would also highly recommend. Mm -hmm. it, so for, for, mm -hmm. No, no, finish out all day. No, f f f I would recommend this approach for people who don't spend their entire life coding. If you're somebody who does spend their entire life coding, uh, it's, it's, it's probably different. And also there are people mm -hmm. who have picked up programming as teenagers, as kids. I think that they might, 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 might work in different way where they can hold more abstractions in their mind and in their brain and they move mm -hmm. through code differently. But for me, that's not the case. Uh, I started to learn to code when I was 30. So this more relaxed approach to coding is what I fully recommend and also uh, learn your tools, uh, learn VS Code, if that's what you're doing, learn mm -hmm. uh, Vim, Tmax, whatever it is, <laughs> tools, use tools to your advantage. And right now, of course, uh, a great way to learn to program is by talking to LLMs. So I can't imagine my life without Copilot yes. anymore. So you, oh, so you actually like it, you use it every day, like you enjoy it. I love it. It's the best thing. And I, hmm. I, uh, <laughs> I needed my friends to convince me to start using those tools because I thought uh, they just give you ver verbose code and it's useless. But if you know where they fit in your programming um, repertoire, then they become extremely powerful, extremely valuable. Uh, for instance, I had to write some bash scripts and those bash scripts evolve <clears throat> over time, but I'm not a bash programmer. Like I always hated bash and partially because the syntax is, is what it is. And you have totally. all these different flags and the behavior is so weird because you get a different result. Mm -hmm. If you run a bash script via doing source or via, you know, uh, executing it bash and the script name and so forth. And then uh, um, a script will do, I, even recently I learned that if you modify a bash script while it's running, it will give you an error most often, because if you run a bash script, it, it is being read and executed line by line. So it will remember how many characters Ooh. from the beginning it ran. And uh, then, you know, and so these finer details. Like there's no way, uh, maybe if you study Bash books, Bash programming books, maybe you would learn, learn about some of these, but Bash is extremely painful to me at least. And if I want to write something in Bash, I ask Copilot, I tell it, Hey, write me this if condition, write me this, write me that. And, or I will highlight the line and ask Copilot, what does this line do? How can I modify this to do this and that? And obviously, when I copy the code, I edit it, right? I won't use directly what, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what Copilot gives me, though there are exceptions as well, because recently when I was, when I tried to, when I wanted to download a YouTube video and parse it using Whisper and run some statistics on it, I only talked to Copilot and it kept giving me the code. I kept asking it to change the code. It's just a great experience. How do you see, so you've been through the fast AI learning approach, project-based learning approach. Um, how do you see LLMs fitting into that whole paradigm? Because I, I, I personally enjoyed, you know, I, I saw you did a post the other day about um, you had given it an objective function and it kind of explained what the objective function was doing. And I thought that was a beautiful use of, I think it was ChatGPT you probably were using. Um, any thoughts on how LLMs and like fast AI converge to hyper accelerate your progress? Yes, most definitely. So with LLMs, you have a coach who's there for you 24 seven. 
And that's for $20, right? $20 mm -hmm. a month. That's just ridiculous. So you get tailored um, answers to your specific circumstances, and you can keep asking it uh, and refining what you want over and over again. It stopped feeling tedious to me when I noticed that I can talk just about the stuff that I care about and it still gives you um, like hallucinations. Of course, they're an issue, but I think they're blown up out of proportion. And uh, for many things, um, it definitely makes me a much stronger programmer. And it's a mm -hmm. tool that I wished I had when I was starting out. Because if I had a question, I had to Google for it. Uh, this took time. Maybe there was a Stack Overflow answer, maybe not, or I looked in books. It just makes the loop much faster. You can iterate much faster on your ideas. And when I talk to people, I keep running into folks who uh, do amazing things. Um, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I only started to code recently, but now, how did I develop this, this for a Kaggle competition? There was this guy who took a massive 70 billion model and he mm -hmm. executed it line by line on a 16 GB GPU or, or layer by layer. And he also did it in a very interesting way because he would have one query and a couple of uh, passages. So he would, you know, uh, run on the query once and then reuse those results. And he said that, mm -hmm. no, you know, I, I only started to, so this is highly complex. Like, you know, you're getting the internals of an LLM. And he also figured out how to do it on two GPUs uh, concurrently. So <laughs> not, not, not an easy thing. And he pointed me to, to the fact that, hey, I actually was able to do this by talking to, a, to an LLM. So, wow. um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's a really exciting time, and I, I think I've shifted my own uh, learning metric to now a product metric. So if I know, so now I'm experimenting. If I know something well, I can make a product out of it. Because at least what I've found, especially with the LLM domain now, for instance, on the inference side, the, the inference performance really comes down to the absolute lowest level people writing. CUDA kernels, um, there's some hardware optimization. So that, that work tends to be quite complex. And then when you end up maybe reading a research paper, your ability to maybe put that research paper into true practice and, uh, to get some benefit oftentimes takes both your work and the team's work in a specific environment. You might need hardware. So now I'm, I've kind of shifted to, okay, if I can take these things and put it into a product, then, then I really know. And for me, the product, uh, the product forcing or, or enforcing that product mindset is just at the end of the day, we all have to sell something. You know what I mean? And, and if I can get closer and closer to that skill, it aligns me to what production use cases, all of the requirements of a production use case, which, are, which tend to be the most important, at least um, for most jobs outside of research. Certainly, certainly. It's a very valuable skill set and something that is not figured out how to do it for LLMs. There are mm -hmm. new solutions that are coming out all the time and um, there's not much written about it. You have to uh, rely on, on people discovering it uh, via talking to other people or trying things themselves and maybe they will put them in uh, writing or in a YouTube video. Um, Kamal Hussein, he has an amazing blog and I would absolutely recommend, uh, for what you're trying to do for serving stuff that this is probably the best, uh, source of, of knowledge on what's available and yeah, yeah I'll definitely check that out. Um, <clears throat> so you, you're a content producer, so you've, you've begun your, yeah. you began the YouTube journey and you talk a lot about um, whether or not you should push your stuff out online. And, and there was something I picked up in one of your videos and it was around the engineering skills that you have are more important for you becoming 
Well, or, excuse me, they're more important than your actual influencer skills. And, and the example that you brought up was um, Andre Kapati, right? So when people think of him, they love him just because he's a beast at what he does. And I had just had a, I just did an interview with a Harpreet Sahota uh, from Deep Learning Daily or the CAI. And it's interesting that he had stopped his podcast just to focus on, on his technical skills. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm really happy that you highlighted that. But following that thread, tweeting is a big part of, I think, how a lot of people in machine learning build their personal brand. Um, mm-hmm. If you suck at tweeting, because it <laughs> seems like tweeting has a very specific culture, like Twitter, I, I haven't figured it out yet. Um, what advice do you have for people who suck at tweeting? And what is, you know, <laughs> a, a, any insight there? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um... So the reason I'm, I have my YouTube channel is mostly to learn how to talk on camera. I, mm. I, I've learned how to write. I like, so I went from not being able to talk on, on the forums. Like I didn't know what it was about. You, 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 if you're not part of this online culture, you don't really know how it works. Like what's the appropriate way to talk to others. And how does it all work so first i learned how to talk on the forums and then i learned how to write blog posts and maybe i'm not a fabulous writer but you know at least i can write a blog post that somewhat works um i also learned a little bit about tweeting right but uh, mm-hmm. recently listening to a, a great lecture by patrick winston who is uh, who was unfortunately because he passed away um oh no uh, yes, yes, re- relatively recently, but uh, he had a, an enormous life, uh, you know, an enormous ca- career in AI, and uh, he was also a great teacher. So this was a lecture w- on giving uh, talks, and he uh, mentioned something that stuck in my mind was that your uh, life, success in your life, uh, or what you will be able to achieve will be uh, it depends on your ability to talk about your ideas, to write about your ideas, and to have good ideas in that order. In that mm-hmm. order. So uh, speaking is just an extremely uh, valuable skill set to have. And we know that, uh, f- for, for instance, um, why do people make so much money on YouTube from advertising? That's because uh, if you see somebody, if you hear somebody, they have a much bigger impact on you than if you just know a person via their writing. Same with podcasts, for instance, uh, when somebody is in your ear, the, there's a completely different relationship. So if somebody mm-hmm. doesn't know how to tweet, I think that at least that has been my experience. And that's why I keep going back to refiguring if uh, having an online persona is that important. It's because all this is challenging to me on a personal level, on an emotional level, right? Yeah. So the biggest obstacle to me was not that I couldn't write blog posts, which is, yeah, I, I had no idea about write, how to write a blog post. And my, my initial blog that I had many years before starting Fast AI, it you know, didn't have readers and I didn't know what I was doing anyhow. But that the, that overcoming that emotional hurdle is is the is, is is what the game is about for me you know mm-hmm. uh, so if somebody says that they're not great at twitter they probably have an issue with putting their name to some words that they share online uh, mm-hmm. they might be worried about how they will be received a great worry of mine and of anyone that i ever spoke to who is open about it, uh, especially for people who are deeply technical, is that you will be discovered for the noob that you are, the imposter syndrome. Or like in my case, some people maybe know me via fairly advanced technical work that I did somewhere. And then, hey, I have this YouTube mm-hmm. channel where I'm, you, you can tell that I'm nervous in those videos and they're maybe not that great, etc. You know, so, so overcoming this hurdle, this, this is the real issue. And as for the know-how, um, there, are, there are 
great sources where you can learn how, how to make writing a bit more effective. But it's essentially the same thing with, with mm -hmm. code, the same idea. You want to maximize the clarity of your thinking and maximize the uh, amount of content that you share, the, the amount of value that you share per uh, number of sentences or number of words. That's how the online world works. No one has the time, uh, unless they're deeply interested in the problem matter, to go through a blog mm -hmm. post that is that goes on and on that is worthy so that's that's one of the skills that you want to develop and there, there are ways to do it online but but the biggest hurdle i find is emotional well, i appreciate you articulating that emotional component and I, and I think you know i have a decent following on on linkedin and i find it's a different medium to express yourself than twitter twitter as you're saying it is compressed and then I think the frequency as well um, is what sort of caught me off guard. It's like, oh, I have to say something every so and so and so. And sometimes for me, it's just I take these long periods of just learning and I, I tend to use Twitter to learn more than I, I think I share in reality. So thanks for, for clarifying some of that. Um, I know we're getting a little closer to time. So I wanted to ask, uh, funny enough, I have another podcast called Progress Guaranteed because mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with personal development sort of outside of work. Um, what's your career optimization function? So it could be wealth, it could be free time, it could be, um, what, what has it been for you so far? Not being bored. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, there, there, okay. There's nothing too deep to that. Uh, I feel like I'm doing things and I'm getting lucky and there's no, not much foresight. Uh, um, I'm, I'm better at uh, tactics than I'm at strategizing at the big picture. Mm. And uh, if you have a family, many things are, you, you have many cons constraints. Um, if I were 20 years old and had the energy and the time, I would probably optimize for learning and for using my time for for having personal freedom in how I can use my time. And that's that's mm -hmm. what I would probably mm -hmm. optimize for. But right now I'm I'm sort of in, in a happy space uh, in a happy place and um, I yeah I, I feel that it's much more conducive to my life right now to relax a bit more to appreciate what I have, mm -hmm, to spend time mm -hmm. with my family, than to push very hard yes. because I tried that and it just doesn't work with my life. And I want to mm -hmm. follow my curiosity. You know, um, like I was, I, I became fascinated by the Toyota production system because I, I just think it's, it's so great where, and uh, yeah, so whatever, I got five books, I started reading them. I can. That's another nice aspect mm -hmm. right now. If a book costs, or I have this book right about cinematography. <laughs> I don't know. It was maybe fifty dollars, mm. whatever. Um, I, it's it, 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 yeah. Th th these things are just not uh, not a problem for me anymore. And uh, wh wherever the curiosity takes me, I want to. I want to study that. I want to learn that because. I just, it's, it's, it's what I can do. So why not? Mm -hmm. While obviously I care about work and I want to do extremely well at work. So, so don't get me wrong, but that's uh, completely different to saying that I want to be a millionaire or I want to have $10 million in 10 years or something like that, which maybe yes. works for others, but it doesn't work for my life. So. Hmm. I, I need to, I, I go in these waves of of things I get interested in. I think it was last year I bought, I realized that I don't play any musical instruments. So my mm -hmm. own mental development was technically impaired because everyone that I looked at that was um, truly savants to a degree, they, they had a musical bent. Well, I, I guess I was just curious as to uh, what that, what learning on that side of my brain, that said, right, say, uh, would have been. Mm -hmm. So I ended up buying um, a drum set, a piano, a DJ set, <laughs> a beat making set, 
Oh, lovely. <laughs> it, it was interesting. You know, I, I think that quickly faded in terms of like, okay, I have other stuff to do. But mm-hmm. it, was, it was nice to at least give myself the space to attempt to explore some of those other things. Yes, yes uh, absolutely. And oh. um, if you read about uh, inventors or uh, scientists, many of them had such a thing. Einstein had his violin, right? Mm-hmm. And yes. it goes again to this diffused mode of thinking. You will have a very hard time if you only uh, use the focus mode of thinking and you only, you know, study, uh, read and try to crack a problem like that. You need this um, other mode for the Eureka moments. Uh, people went about it in various ways. There were people who were, were taking naps during the day. Uh, I don't know if it was, maybe it was Pablo Picasso. No, probably not. But uh, one guy would... No, it's Edison. Uh, Edison, yeah. Edison, Edison. Uh, was he the guy yeah. who mm-hmm. held the key in his hand? Okay, right. You yeah, know, like so he had he keys, would... he would take uh, two metal balls in his hand and then when he fell asleep, it would hit and he would wake up and yes. he would be in this like theta state to... I'm, I'm a big napper. Like if I don't nap, my brain just <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> yeah, that's how I got a PhD. I used to, you know, you, you're working in there. I, okay. Every time I hit a problem, you know, there's some folks that when they hit a problem, you know, they, they zone in and, you know, they could, uh, they could tackle that problem for like hours. They won't eat. I'm the complete opposite. A problem comes, I'm like, I immediately want to go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> for like 20 minutes and then I'm good. I figured it out. Let's roll. Love um, it. Love it. That, 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 that sounds great. Uh, do you have a couple of minutes left? I yeah, I yeah, I have. I have uh, yeah. a okay. bunch of time. Yeah, sure thing. Cool, cool. All right. Yeah, I had some, some other interesting uh, questions to ask. So publishing. So you, mm-hmm. you've gone through that, that process of publishing an online book. Do you have any advice mm-hmm. for, for folks thinking about that? And sort of my reasons for asking this question, um, in addition to some of the other content producing questions, comes back to that career optimization function. So recently, I had a friend who passed away and she was very young. Um, so that forced me to add a new term to my objective function, which you would appreciate, and actually weight that higher. So the probability that I might die young, I have to actually, you know, now include that as part of my objective function. And so with that, I started thinking a lot more about, um, you know, there's content that I think all of us want to produce, but we don't ever make the jump to produce it. Um, so what? From that perspective, what advice do you have for folks who may want to write an ebook? There's a great book by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you go on Tim Ferriss's podcast, he did interviews with writers for a while. He had this phase where he interviewed like big American writers. Mm-hmm. And what is very surprising is that there is a cadence to writing. There is a way that mm. writers write. There is a, a great book by Stephen King uh, on writing, I think, where he, it's autobiographical, but it's also about the art of writing. And again, just like everything in life, writing, doing machine learning, they're not what they seem to be from the outside. So there's uh, one uh, adage in the war of art. I don't remember who said this, but a famous writer was asked, um, wh- when does the inspiration for you s- strike? Uh, how do you get set up for writing? And he said, oh yes, I only write when the inspiration hits me, but fortunately it always does so at, uh, 9 AM every weekday, you know? And there's a solution. You just put your butt in front of the laptop and you just type out the words. And there's another concept that's, uh, that comes from a famous uh, songwriter and Ed Sheeran, right? Uh, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. When he was asked, uh, how do you write uh, lyrics that are so relevant to so many people? And he said that it's sort of like 
opening a tab that hasn't been used for many years. At first, it's hmm. the murky water that will come out. But via quantity, you start getting to the good stuff. So just let the water run out, write a lot of words and uh, see where that takes you. But uh, here I feel again that our biggest uh, opponent is emotional. Uh, our emotional issues where you start thinking, is this good enough? Uh, why would people even care to read that? Or maybe I should be doing something else. So um, if you can deal with that part, uh, the, 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 the technicalities probably are much simpler to acquire. And it's very nice that uh, some writers yes. who write, they are open about how they write. Just how Jeremy Howard uh, was open about writing, uh, doing machine learning. You can likewise learn from these people. Yes. I think I've experienced something very similar on, on the podcasting side. So by the end of this month, I would have, you know, three podcasts that I'm running. You know, none of them are anything big, you know, as you compare yourself. And, and I think that's also very interesting. Um, that comparison, when you come back to that emotional blockage to some degree, that comparison to something that, you know, we've taught to see, no, if you're not a Tim Ferriss or you're, you're, you're book is crap, like who's, who's going to read it. And so I appreciate you um, articulating the fact that we just need to continue to practice our craft. And um, I think even me reaching out to you, when I initially reached out to you just to, to form a relationship, for me, that was like a big step. I'm like, oh, this guy is big cargo grandmaster. And I'm like, wow, like, why would these people <clears throat> talk to me? So I personally want to make sure that everyone listening um, is that they do take a chance and, and to, to honor the energy that's in them to, to create these things and, and to just go out there and, and continue doing it. This would have been my, yeah, this is my ninth episode on this podcast. And like, I looked at yours, I think you're over, um, how many episodes are you up to on, on your podcast right now? So I'm, I'm doing various things on the channel. You know, there are some true, interviews. True, yes. Yeah, yeah. So you have different videos. That's, yeah, yeah. Th that's another thing. Like I don't even count and. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to uh, set quantity goals for myself because I believe mm. that you can arrive at quality via quantity. That's, mm. uh, that's how, it, how it works everywhere I try. And uh, so I'm not sure that, yeah, there were a bunch of interviews. Uh, there are a bunch of other videos. And, and now I will probably try to do something new again uh, just because... Uh, I'm doing all those things for myself, you know, um, yes. like we, we think, and we, there's this aspect of helping others that's extremely important. And I want to, even in the tiniest extent, contribute to the life of other people. And I want to maybe make the world in this very tiny uh, degree, a better place. But uh, when you, the book that I wrote or the blog post that I write, or the videos that I record, the first intention is to do it for myself. It's for you. Mm. It's for me. It's uh, me trying to bootstrap some ideas in my mind. It's me trying to learn something. And what I produce is a side product, but a side product that is extremely valuable for me. Because uh, if I learn something, mm, I do something, and then I have to write about said thing, I, I get a chance to uh, reevaluate it, to focus on it, to figure out what, learn, what worked and what didn't. Um, some famous educator said that uh, we don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. So mm. that's why uh, what we would call producing content. And for the longest time, I didn't understand it. Um, I thought that somehow I'm competing with other people on Twitter for the amount, for the reach that my tweets get. But that's not uh, satisfying. That's not rewarding. Um, yes, it is, it, is, it is a tool for your own personal learning. So I want to challenge myself in the videos that I create mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and become a stronger speaker. And if somebody watches them, that's great. But 
If not, then I still should be happy. I should be equally happy. Yes. I, I'm happy you said that too, because I had watched your channel initially, I think when you had first come out and, and I was like, oh yeah, he's doing it. And I, I always admired that you were very truthful about what you were trying to do. And you're like, hey, I'm, I'm at this point. I'm, I'm going to get better. And, and you, you can literally see that evolution of you throughout the videos. So and for, for me, it was, it was good to see someone who was as popular as you were in the machine and the community also saying, hey, I'm, I'm not very good at this yet. And, and you, you, know, you would articulate the yet and you would just see your effort, that, that, that effort approach to optimizing versus um, probably deliberating a lot and maybe not executing as much. So it, it was cool to, to really see that blossom. And even in your interviews now, I, I could see you're a lot more comfortable than when you had initially interviewed some folks. So it, it's nice to, um, to see that evolution. And for myself in, in like kicking off a podcast, like I'm, I'm not popular on Kaggle or anything like that. So I, I think the mechanisms for you to grow an audience are slightly different, but I, I, I also flipped it on my head. I'm like, okay, why am I doing this? And I, I have to remind myself every day, it, it's about meeting the people. It's about actually in, inspiring just myself. So when I, I come to ask all these questions, I'm, I'm literally just asking these things to myself just to, um, you know, to, to learn from people that I think yes. are much better at what they do than I do. And I, I'm sort of inspired to, to learn as much um, and to learn from everyone I interview. So I appreciate you sharing that. That's that, 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 yeah, I feel the same. I feel exactly what you described. And there are many people who feel that, Hey, I recorded this video, but I got 10 views or whatever. It's a wasted effort. But, um, this point of your journey is very valuable because that's where you have to learn where, where you can mm -hmm. learn, where you get to learn. And, uh, it actually helps that maybe people don't see that many things from you that are not that great. So this, this obscurity <laughs> is, uh, is something to be leveraged, not something to be despised. And, uh, another, um, aspect here. No, oh, yeah, that, that I, I, I believe that was that's an it. excellent and, uh, point. That was, I, I, that was a very no, hidden I, circle. <laughs> excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the, the other thing here is that, uh, I might never be a great sp speaker, right? I, I, I might never be as good as, uh, I don't know, like f folks who have these large podcasts, but, uh, or who, you know, or TV anchors, uh, <laughs> at, at news stations, but just because it's a complementary skill set, uh, if I can be decent and good at machine learning and decent at this. How many people do you know who are good at machine learning and who run an interesting YouTube channel? How many people are yes. there? You know, there, there are very few, there are very few. So mm -hmm. you immediately stand out. Uh, so in some sense, the, re the, the fact that it's so challenging, it's, it's also, yeah, it's it just, it just how it is. It, it makes it worthwhile. But uh, confusing, uh, uh, at this point, I'm completely not uh, interested in growing my channel or growing my audience because, yeah, uh, like if you it's look a, at the influencers, essentially, yeah, the, right? and it's, it's just for me to learn. And if I can help somebody, like I got a couple of comments on one of the videos that I uploaded and I thought that, hey, I've already made it. You know, this is what I, what, what I want, what I care about. Uh, there is uh, Ali Abdal. Uh, I'm not sure if you know him. He's he's a, mm -hmm. a very popular YouTuber, um, a doctor turned YouTuber, and he says that success in life is uh, uh, talking uh, about the things that interest you to people that might care. And mm. yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, I think I would go about many huh. things in a different way if, if, if I, if, if I wanted to grow the channel, but, uh, I also followed the paths of, uh, online creators of influencers who make this their main, um, 
activity in life, how they make money. And it's an extremely stressful life, you know, and there are not that many of them that make it. Whereas mm -hmm. if you know machine learning really well, you know, it's a, it's a completely different, different <laughs> scenario. So it, it's sort of like mm -hmm. kids uh, willing to become a soccer player. Mm, in Poland, soccer is uh, extremely big and yeah, but you know, look who has a good life from playing soccer, right? I mean, it's great to have such goals. And if you feel that you have the talent, no, I, I'm all for it. Like, I would love if my kids find something that they're passionate about. It doesn't matter. Crocheting, soccer, you know, archery, I don't care. This is a great experience to pursue something with, with, with a passion. But for making money, um, how many soccer players do you know that have a good life uh, percentage wise? versus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, machine learning uh, <laughs> uh, folks. And this is even stronger for, for influencers. So no, uh, yes. uh, it, it's probably, it's probably sort of a good idea to not get caught up in those vanity metrics. Hmm. It's interesting that you bring that up because I think that's also one of the reasons I stay in machine learning as I look at the, the reward per unit effort. In addition, I think a lot of these online platforms, it's a self-expression. It's also a very creative thing. And oftentimes creators get into the situation where they have to obey the algorithm versus create. And, and it really yeah. limits, I think, the true beauty of their art. Um, so I guess that's the secret. Learn, learn machine learning and then become a podcaster and blogger uh, on the side. Yeah, the, the, that's, uh, that's one approach. And... <laughs> I'm sure that there are many other approaches to life, but that's just mm -hmm. my past that, but, uh, but well, I, I clearly, learn... clearly it's working. It's working quite well <laughs> so far, um, so far. So, so in, in, in getting a little closer, uh, what's one topic outside of work that fascinates you? <laughs> could be current. It could be, you know, it could be fleeting. It, it's all good. There are a lot of things. For a while, I was very interested in the concept of a factory. I read yes. this fabulous book, Behemoth, about the history of the factory. And mm. for, first of all, in sort of how do they work and how they evolve, but also how they impact the social fabric of the societies that we are a part of. Mm -hmm. um, then it was, uh, then I started reading those Toyota production system books and, um, transplanting the ideas to the world that I'm familiar with, to learning or to how teams are organized. And for instance, they have a very interesting concept of waste of uh, Muda and eliminating, um, waste from, from the production line. And I just can tell how wasteful it is for me to wor worry about how people will react to my videos. You know, like I'm investing mm. so much energy into that, that if I can overcome this uh, hurdle, how it will uh, make my ability to produce things uh, uh, much more efficient. Um, what else? Uh, my wife got me uh, golf lessons for my birthday. I never played golf. Nice. So now nice. I'm excited about golf uh, just because uh, uh, it seems challenging and there's the body mechanics that are involved. I don't know, like the world is a fascinating place and uh, there are so many exciting things. You just have to look around, uh, find the right books, find the right teachers and you will never be bored. You will never be bored mm -hmm. and until, you know, you're 130 and uh, maybe your life comes to an end. You will never be bored. So that's a fantastic feature of the, of the world that we are a part of. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so you had mentioned a couple of books so far. Um, any, mm -hmm. what are, you know, three books you recommend people read? They could be from anything, you know, it could be the Toyota book that you mentioned. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. The War of Art, yes. Yes. Uh, then, uh, then let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Origin of Wealth. Origin For, of Wealth. Th this is the best book I read in my entire life. 
absolutely the best book. And for people who are into machine learning, for people who are into algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, the person there deconstructs the uh, field of economics. He points to some of the, that's also fascinating that you can look at a field uh, at such a, from such a global perspective. So he explains why uh, economics adopted certain mathematical tools, which may be forced it to evolve in a certain direction that is not, uh, not ideal. But then he proposes hmm. uh, how we can learn a lot via uh, studying algorithms, how we can uh, run uh, simulations to learn about the world around us and about the economy. It's uh, the most eye-opening, the most fascinating book I have ever read. Then uh, I also like sci-fi a lot and uh, the, the Hyperion Trilogy. You absolutely mm. recommend it. Hyperion Trilogy, um, Forever War, uh, what else we have there? Many people uh, care about uh, their money and investing. So uh, there's, uh, there's one book about uh, Wall Street, uh, Walk Down Wall Street, I think, something like that. It's about the index funds and a very interesting book. Uh, oh, that's, there's a, um, uh, I think I know you're talking. It's from a hedge fund manager, right? Um, yes. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah. A random mm -hmm. walk down Wall Street. Mm, mm, okay. <laughs> so just read that and you will be much uh, less uh, uh, or, or, or various uh, scams uh, <laughs> or various, uh, various offers that are dubious uh, will become much less uh, appealing to you once you read that book. Uh, I also really like the book uh, for anyone who's interested in entrepreneurship. And I never spoke about this online, but uh, it's a great book. It's called uh, Millionaire Fastlane. Mm -hmm. The Millionaire mm -hmm. Fast Lane. And why is this a great book? Because um, he explains uh, what does it mean to be rich. So Ooh. who is rich? A person who has uh, a lot of money in their bank account, but they are stressed out. They work 70 hours a week. They ha hate their life. They are exhausted. Uh, is this the definition of being rich, of being well off? Or uh, he proposes something else. He proposes, hey, maybe being well off is being able to spend your time how you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that to many people, this can be very eye opening. It, it has been eye opening to me. No, that made me think a lot. I actually haven't read that book. I think the four hour work week really made me think twice about, because in that book, what he showcases is that, you know, <clears throat> plan your ideal life. And then just figure out how much money it is to live that ideal life every year. And that, that's the game that, that you have to play, not, not these other abstracted games that maybe get um, shown to you. Oh, those, are, those, those are some, some good suggestions. Um, yes. what's, one piece of what's one piece of advice you have for uh, a high schooler, a college person, and a professional in, in that order? Oh my goodness. For a high schooler? learn to code and do something fun, whatever it mm. is. Like you can do so many things with code and don't do things that you feel you should be doing because of something. Just find your niche in code that, that excites you and follow the rabbit hole. Uh, mm -hmm. For a college student, you probably want to start thinking about having a body of work that you can point your potential employer to. Mm. So a portfolio of blog posts, um, GitHub repositories. And for a professional, maybe again, it's sort of like for the teenager, for the high schooler. Uh, I know that life of a professional can be very tough and you have all these constraints on your time. So again, find something that excites you. And if there's an overlap between that and your work, you know, you've made it. This is, this is what you mm. want. So this is uh, the piece of advice that I'm giving myself as well. 
you know, right now. Seek out yes. what excites you, give it some of your time and talk about it, write about it, find other people who are excited about that same thing. That's fantastic. Uh, so here's a rapid round of three questions to, to round off. So you're stuck on this, on this magical island and you have a specialized <laughs> yes. chef who can cook any two meals. They could cook, mm -hmm. you know, that person could cook any two meals that you want, but that's the only thing that you get for the rest of the time you're on the island, which is a long time. Which two meals would you choose? Steak and salmon. Mm. Yeah. As, as a meal? As like one meal? No, okay, oh, separately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> separately. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Steak and salmon. Yeah, that's, that's clean. That's <laughs> simple. <laughs> simple. Uh, I, I hope that uh, it could be ideally artificial meat grown somewhere in a lab. That would mm -hmm. be even better. Mm -hmm. Give the animals a little, you know, a little break as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, like, um, I, I don't think about that very much, but the industry around producing meat is uh, very bad for the environment. It's very mm -hmm. bad for the animals often. And this is the part of the world that I hope will change uh, within time. Mm, but if I were to mention the two most, uh, or the two meals that I enjoy the most, unfortunately, in this case, they are meat based. Uh, yes. But um, exquisite salads, I'm all for that. You just mentioned two meals. So th those mm -hmm. things came immediately to my mind. But yeah, yeah it's interesting. That, so I asked this question to a bunch of different people. And so it's interesting to see um, salads are very important to people. That's what I've learned. I'm, I would not have put salad in, in my, <laughs> in mine at all. Uh, Neither would I, um, but, but <laughs> I do enjoy them as well every now and then. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's one thing that brings you joy? Sleeping. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Having a good night's <laughs> sleep and books, obviously books. Mm. I mm. love books and I don't mean it in the sense where some people carry reading books like a badge of honor, how they do knowing mathematics as well. Like that's in the machine learning world, you will come across people who will essentially make math knowledge, something to aspire to and something that positions them above other people because they know math to some extent and some people do the same thing with books, but no, just, uh, you know, the, the silly books, the science fiction books, the fantasy mm -hmm. books, fantasy books about, you know, elves and magic and things like this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting into that more now. And I just started playing, uh, video games with my partner. So just, you know, just exploring this, this true playful, uh, exploratory mm -hmm. realm and I'm watching the show Witcher right now. So that's pushing me back sure. into the, you know, the Elven um, yes. fantasy world. So it's, it's been, it's been fun. And the Witcher okay. is by the world is, mm -hmm. is by a Polish author, you know, uh, that those books, really? I didn't know that. the oh. series that is based. And this is my famous mm. uh, favorite, my favorite fantasy series. I read them as a teenager, seven books. Um, uh -huh. They're unbelievable. They're, they're completely different. And they are based in the lore uh, of this part of the world as well. So the monsters that Geralt is fighting, you know, they come mm -hmm. from legends. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. And as for gaming, uh, I also have great fun playing with my kids. So we, we've been mm -hmm. playing Stardew Valley. Oh, so good. Just farming together. The, the oh, best experience ever. Huh. Yeah. If you're looking for a good. Mm -hmm. to play a co-op game on. Yeah. I'm playing this game called It Takes Two. So you're a, you're a pair of parents who are getting a divorce and like you turn into these dolls and then you go through your entire house to someone's forcing you to fall in love again. So it's very interesting. It, it can get kind of dicey when you're playing with your partner because at some point, <laughs> like you really need to cooperate. So if you're not cooperating, like it'll, I think it stresses your relationship, but it's good. Cause you see I love it. like how your communication patterns are, but, but it's been fun. 
Um, no, that's that game is definitely on my list. Thank you for the for the suggestion. Yes, and I don't play video games at all, like at all. And I've I've actually like really enjoyed it. The gameplay, the set design, um, it's amazing. The depth of what you can do um, in a game, especially as a co-op, like all the different things you could do. So my my uh, last question is meant not necessarily from a famous perspective. It's more meant from a a long term guiding light perspective. What do you want people to remember about you? I don't care. Mm. The, 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 they don't need to remember anything about me. Like, you know, I, I'm trying to fight that whole uh, notion and like, whoa, what is life? You know, who are we mm -hmm. in 100 mm -hmm. years? I will be gone. Everyone who I care about will be gone. It's not a good thing to concern yourself with. I mm -hmm. feel so. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's my recipe. If, no, if there's a, a cool if there's one thing I would like to be for other people is you know somebody who maybe helped them in some way, contributed to them having an easier time. But uh, it's uh, an internal motivation, so I'm not sure. There's probably a lot of value in not worrying too much what others will think of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to say, um, interviewing you puts a certain energy in, into my, my mind and my spirit from a continue to do it perspective, um, not not be so concerned with maybe what people think about what it is that I'm doing. And I, I hope if anyone listens to this and they listen all the way to the end that they feel um, the true value of your persistence that you've taken over time. And um, I love that you serve as a fantastic open data point about putting in the effort and, you know, you could arrive at the top machine learning company in the world, being from remote regions, learning to code at 30. Uh, I've, I've truly enjoyed um, you sharing your story. So thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Mark. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, sir. Fantastic. All right. <laughs>